God, we come to you today, Lord, just giving ourselves to you and asking, oh God, that you would just guide us into truth, that we might know your will for our lives, especially in the area of this, this important subject, this important topic of stewardship. We pray, oh God, that you would have your way with us now, and we pray and ask your blessing over our time together as we kick off, Lord, this 40-day initiative. Lord, may you be glorified. May we be strengthened and strengthened to the point of that we apply your truth to our lives. We thank you and we praise you now for all these things that we ask your blessing upon as we ask it in the mighty and the strong name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise. Amen. How many of you have uh, sermon notes? Or how many of you don't have them? If you don't have sermon notes, raise your hands. If you don't have them, so that the ushers can get them to you. This is the kickoff of our 40 days of placing God first. And uh, we are excited. We've been working for over a year to get to this place. And so we are finally here. Finally here. 40 days of placing God first. One of the things that I like about the Bible is that uh, it, it is such a practical guidebook for life. It guides us through the realities of life. And if we're going to be healthy in our Christian life, it is important that we experience growth. Uh, we must go to the next level, if you will, in our walk with Christ. And so the Bible says that we are to grow in our lives. Listen to what God promises us. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 7 says this. Let your roots grow down into him and draw up nourishment from him so you will grow in faith, strong and vigorous in the truth that you were taught. Let your lives overflow with thanksgiving for all that he has done. You look at this verse, you'll see that this verse promises that if you let these things happen, you will grow strong and you will grow vigorous. And so God is promising a lifetime of growth. There's probably about one of th three experiences uh, that we, we have when we experience this personal growth. Uh, the first some people experience uh, might be called a one-time experience uh, of growth. And this is where you have the feeling that something has happened. And maybe it was all the way back when you were a child. Maybe it was back when you were a kid and uh, you went to camp or you went to a youth rally or, or uh, you were, for us older folk, uh, you went to the morning bench and something happened spiritually. The problem is you've never been able to build on that experience. And all it's ever given you is that feeling that I... I, I I know things could be different because of what happened back then. I just don't know how to get to that place right now. And so some people have that experience. Others <clears throat> have what we might call an every once in a while experience of growth. That every once in a while you grow a little bit, but then it seems like you fall back. Can I get a witness? There's a little bit of progress, but it's followed by long periods in between when you feel disconnected from God and from other people. And a lot of people have that kind of experience. And this is a sort of a one step forward and eight steps back kind of experience that we have in our walk with the Lord. And I would love for us just to get to the point where we have a three steps forward and two steps back experience of growth. Because, see, I know better than to expect perfection from us. That doesn't exist we're human beings, we're going to stumble from time to time, and we're going to fall sometimes. But we've got to let God pick us up. But it is possible to have three steps forward and two steps back in our experience. Anybody in here other than me that has ever experienced uh, uh, two, three steps forward and two steps back in their life? Where you've gotten to the place where you say, I didn't have a perfect day. I messed up here and I messed up there. But overall, I'm making some progress. 
Overall, some good things have happened in my life. And then the last kind of experience is this one that God promises us in this verse, that you can enjoy a lifetime experience of growth, where you see God making some differences, you see God making some changes in your life, that you are at the place where you can say, I'm not where, uh, what I used to be, but I think, I, I'm not where I want to be, but I thank God I am not where I used to be. Can I get a witness? So that we understand that, that growing is like climbing a mountain, where, where you go up a little and then you find yourself going down into that little ravine and then going back up and going uh, back down into another little ravine. But you're making progress overall. And that's how growth works. You start up the mountain and you go down into one of these little dips. And sometimes it's an emotional dip, sometimes it's a relational dip that you find yourself in or whatever. But when that happens, you feel like you're at the beginning, like you've made no progress at all. You get discouraged, but the truth is you have made progress. You just don't feel it. And so you have faith that God is growing you and you just keep right on growing. Someone said God is designed for you to get younger on the inside while you're getting older on the outside. Well, there are three essential ingredients to this lifetime experience of growth. First of all, it takes commitment. Can you say commitment? It takes commitment. Tell your neighbor it takes commitment. See, without commitment, stay with me, there is no growth. See, the good news is that this is God that God is committed to our growth. He is committed to your growth. He's committed to my growth. He's already made that commitment. He's already decided that he wants you to grow. He's committed to your growth, so, so I have to be committed to the process of what God wants to do in my life as I place him first in everything that I do. See, unfortunately, the church has presented a gospel that takes out the process. And everyone wants to be instantly delivered. Everyone wants to be instantly released from from what they're going through. It's it's all about that immediate gratification that we have wrapped ourselves up in, in this life. But I want you to listen to me this morning because when I think of the student that God has blessed with, with natural intelligence, or the athlete that God has blessed with certain natural abilities, or, or the musician that God has blessed with certain God-given abilities verb, vocally and, and, and musically and instrumentally, they, they have all the tools given to them by God. But if they think that they can just show up having not studied or trained or practiced and perform at quality level, then they're sadly mistaken because each has to make a commitment to build on those abilities. Are you with me? And so the same is true for our spiritual growth, that God has put everything into you and into me that we need for our spiritual growth. He's given to us the Holy Spirit. He gives you people. He gives you the church. He gives you his word. He puts the tools there, but then you have to make a commitment to build on what God has put in your life. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the, the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. If you have time, you can go back and look at this verse because it's in this verse that the prophet Hanani was speaking to King Asa. And the king had decided that he would go out and find a foreign ruler, a foreign power that he would depend upon to get victory in the battle that he was about to ensue. And so instead of depending on God, he was depending on a foreign ruler. And I told Asa in verse 7, he says, Because you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hand. See, God may have wanted to use a partnership with that foreign ruler, but the issue 
was that the king was not relying on God. He was relying on someone else. And that's what King Asa is hearing from the prophet in this text. He is hearing, you need to be fully committed. The question behind commitment is, what is it that you are relying on? Who is it that you are relying on? And so to know the goal, to know the goal is a moot point if you're committed to the wrong thing. Can I get a witness? And that's why King Asa here is hearing from the prophet. The prophet is saying, you need to be fully committed. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14 says, he, speaking of Jesus, gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and make us his very own people, totally committed to doing what is right. In other words, Jesus Christ gave his life, and he gave his life to give us the power to live out this kind of commitment that I'm talking about this morning. And if I'm going to figure it out on my own, if I'm going to figure it out through my own personality, it's not going to work. But Jesus gave his life not only to forgive you, watch this, but also to grow you. And if you don't make a commitment to grow in your attitude toward placing God first in your life, you won't grow in your stewardship. You won't grow in your commitment. You won't grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm talking about taking seven weeks to make a commitment to grow in your stewardship, to grow in your ability to place God first in your life. Are you with me? In, I'm talking about in every aspect of your life. See, there are three commitments right now that you can make that will make all the difference in the world. We're talking about 40 days of placing God first commitments. That every group in our church, first of all, do, is doing 40 days of placing God first. That every small group, every small group that we have, we, listen, we do things together <clears throat> when, when, we, when we focus on something together. Uh, there, there, there's more power when everyone comes together focusing on one thing than if we're all separated doing our own thing. Does that make sense? So if your group hasn't decided yet, then you need to decide right now. It's not too late because we're starting today. Uh, then get together as a group as soon as possible. And then thirdly, every one of us, that every one of us are in a group doing 40 days of placing God first. <clears throat> now, if you're not in a small group yet, and yes, I'm taking time out for a, a commercial uh, break here for you. Uh, you're not in a small group yet, and you've been in a small group, but you've gotten out of it. This is a great time, perfect time to get back into a group or to get in one for the first time because we will be creating more groups. Even though we've gotten started, our groups met on last week. We're still, it's not too late for you to start a group even today. This is the perfect time to get involved in a brand new group. Or you can do your own group in your own neighborhood, in your home, lunchtime at work, whatever. We'll get you started. Can I get a witness? So everybody needs to learn how to place God first in their lives. Now, we also, uh, we announced for weeks that you could also be a host. And so I'm still in my commercial. Host means that you're, you're the one that gathers the group together. In fact, you know, we made it into an acrostic, H-O-S-T. H, have a heart for people. O, open your home or open a place in your office or wherever to meet. S, serve them something to drink or snack on. You know, give them some food. They will come. Amen. T, turn on the DVD. Simple as that. Okay, so this is all doable. Amen? All right. Now, let me get back to the text. If I'm going to grow in my love for God... Not only do I need commitment, the second thing I need is balance. I, I need balance. If I'm going to enjoy a lifetime of growth, it takes balance. Tell your neighbor balance. If I'm just totally committed without balance in my life, all of a sudden I find myself off balance. And you've seen people who seem really excited about growing in their in the Christian life, but it only lasts for two or three weeks, or it only lasts for two or three months. Anybody in here other than me? 
who knows somebody who is unbalanced. Amen. Don't look at your neighbor. Don't look at your husband. Do not look at your wife. They, they're out of balance. Because, watch this, some folk get into all emotions, and when they get into all emotion, then it's out of balance. There's some folk who have no passion at all, and when you have no passion, you're, you're out of balance. See, they're out of balance, and in the same way we need a balanced diet in, in order to remain physically healthy, we need a balanced diet in order to remain spiritually healthy healthy in our lives. So I must, I must have a balance, first of all, in learning God's truth. See, so we, we place God first, watch this, first of all, by studying the Word of God. Because without truth, there is no growth. You can't grow based on a lie. And God, knowing that, He has given us the truth. Thy word is truth, the Bible says. Sanctify us with thy truth. He, t- he tells us the truth in his word about ourselves. That's what we don't like. He-, he tells us the truth about this world. He tells us the truth about life. He tells us the truth about the future. It's in his word that we receive truth. And there's, that's where growth comes from. His word is truth and his truth grows me. But in order for that truth to grow me, it has to get into my life. See, I can't go to the store, buy some miracle grow, bring it home, and just put it on the shelf and think that the plants are going to grow. See, I can't think that the plants are going to feel better about themselves because they know that somewhere in my house, on the shelf, is a bottle of miracle grow. Well, you know, I'm just feeling better about myself because I know he's got some miracle growth somewhere in this house. So likewise, if you think that you're going to feel better just because you have a Bible sitting on your coffee table or you got a Bible on your phone or your iPad, you are sadly mistaken. You've got to get that word into your life. So that we first, we find balance by learning God's word. Secondly, we find balance by writing it on our hearts. See, understanding the Jewish way of thinking, the heart and the mind were connected. As a man thinketh in his heart, thinketh in his heart, so is he. So, so they were connected. And there's a little known secret about getting it into our hearts, getting God's truth into our lives is, is the source of a lot of frustration for a lot of people. Because it, it's based on how, on how God designed us and how we learn and how he's made us. Look, if you will, with me at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 6 through 7. It says, you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children Talk about them when you're at home and when you're away on a journey, when you're lying down, when you're getting up again. Now understand that there are multiple ways that we learn. The text says you repeat them, so repetition. You talk about them, so we discuss them. So you you do it at different times. You do it in different ways. Now, here's the secret about learning God's truth, because I'm designed, you are designed to learn in multiple ways. I've got to get God's truth into my life through multiple and various ways. I've got to get God's truth into my life. Watch this. Sometimes we try to get it in in in, in one way, and we get in, in one way only. Some of you are, are not auditory, so to come and just hear a sermon for, for 40 minutes drives you nuts. You can't sit still. You got to get up. You got to go. Why? Because my method of learning is not through the ear gate. And so we have screens that provide some visual for you. You have notes so that you can look at them because you, you have, there are various ways in which we learn. Are you with me? 
And so the problem is that we're not recognizing how God made us. And so he made us for multiple input. And so that's how we learn. That's how we grow. That's why we have 40-day initiatives at St. John every year. That's why we have times of spiritual renewal. We have a spiritual growth emphasis each year, and we use these multiple ways of learning to get the truth into our lives. See, understand we learn, first of all, by hearing. Now, I've given you this stat again, but let me give it to you again. We forget 95% of what we hear within 72 hours. That's why on Wednesday, if you come to one of my Bible study classes and I ask you, what did I preach about on Sunday? Everybody's going, "Mm -hmm." but I do that for repetition purposes so that we can plug in what's being said on Sunday to what we're studying on Wednesday because it takes repetition and we learn by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. And what you hear on Sunday, though, will leak out before the end of the week. And so we also learn by reading. You read truth. Can I get a witness? Thy word have I hidden in my heart through reading that I might not sin against thee. We we also learn by discussing. And so when we talk to one another about that truth, about what we've learned, it helps us to learn. We learn by memorizing. You say, well, I can't memorize. Oh, yes, you can. You'd be, some of the, you'd be surprised some of the things that you have memorized. As I've demonstrated in times before, there, there are certain jingles that you have heard on, on the TV, on commercials, that even though you didn't take time to learn or sit down and take time to memorize, if I just broke out into one of those songs right now, you would start singing right with me. Word perfect. Yet you sit there and say, well, I can't memorize. Oh, yes, you can memorize. And so we learn by memorizing. We memorize truth for each lesson that we go through this week. And and, and in the weeks to come, the next seven weeks, we will be memorizing Scripture. I will try to supply you once a week with a two-minute devotional on our memory verse. How many of you have been getting my calls on the phone? Amen. I know some of you are hanging up on me still, but that's all right. I'm going to still call you with a two-minute devotional on every week's memory verse. I'm going to try to do that on on a Wednesday of every week during our seven weeks. Can I get an amen? Here's the last way we learn. We learn by doing. That's why Thomas told you today that he was in my class and I disappeared. I disappeared because I prepared him. I let him lead some of the classes while I'm in there. And so pretty soon, you know what? I I didn't come back in there again because I wanted him leading the classes. You got to do. All right, you've learned. Now let's do. You learn by doing. All right. Then I have to have balance, thirdly, in living God's purposes. Living God's purposes. I I place God first, watch this, by living it every day. See, I've got to balance out living God's purposes for my life. Paul talked about living a life of purpose in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 26. He said, so I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. Now let me ask you, what happens to those of you who have a car... When your tires get out of balance, what happens? Well, first, they they wear out a little bit faster. You get this shaking. You get this shimmying kind of thing going on with, with your car. And so the same thing happens when we get out of balance in our life. When we get out of balance, we, we wear out more quickly in our lives. We, we become shakier. Some of y'all shaky. This is true for us and everybody else who, 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 who's a passenger with us in life. That, that's why God wants us in balance. Can I get a witness? He wants us in balance. Paul said that we are to run straight to the goal. And so it's important for us to know the goal. It's important for us to understand God's will for our lives. And our goal is to put God first in three vital areas of our life. To put God first in the use of our time, to put God first in the use of our talent, and to put God first 
in the use of our treasure. You can say amen. We call it stewardship. Don't run. Time, talent, and treasure are God-given and God-owned blessings. See, we use them according to his word and we use them according to his purpose. These are things that God has entrusted to us for kingdom building. Now, let me very briefly define stewardship for you. Let me start by saying stewardship is not money. Stewardship is not about money. In fact, stop right now. Look at your neighbor. Tell your neighbor stewardship is not about money. Thank you. Tell your neighbor on the other side the same thing. Now, I know y'all said that, and you're going to go right out here. This is things about money. This is all about money. No, it is not. Stewardship is about living your life as God designed it. See, God designed that your life be joyfully shared with him and with others. And that you live your life in constant, total dependency upon him. See, what stewardship does is it expresses externally the internal heart relationship with God. And we are responsible now for managing all of God's resources for the purpose of advancing his kingdom. And so when we talk about a steward, we are talking about a manager. Say manager. See, in the biblical and even in non-biblical context, a steward refers to a house servant who takes care of another's property. See, the word actually means the manager of a house. The manager of a house. Joseph was a steward in Potiphar's house. You remember Joseph, don't you? He, he could do anything with anything in the house so long as it matched his master's will. However, one thing in the house Potiphar had not put at Joseph's disposal, and that was his wife. And even when you take the story on later on, and after Joseph goes through his journey to get to where God wanted to get him, we find that Joseph was second to Pharaoh, and his steward put Joseph's goblet in Benjamin's sack to test the brother's sincerity. You see, these are just a few examples of, of, uh, to demonstrate that the steward does not own the house. The steward only manages the house for the owner. See, the steward who serves the household does not always have a pleasant job. That's where we have problems. Because what a steward does is the master's will. The steward does not do their own will. The steward acting as the master's agent serves the well-being of the household. Can I get a witness? One of the common roles of the stewards is indicated in the etymology of the word. Just do a history on the word steward, and you'll find that it's comprised of two old Middle English words, sty and ward. Sty and ward. Sty meaning pig, ward meaning keeper. Keeper. Pig, pig, keeper. Because that person was someone who took care of the master's pigs, slopped the pig, butchered the pig, in order to feed the household. And as God's steward, we treat everything that we possess as though it belongs to God. And we use those things to do God's will and to provide for God's household. Can I get a witness? Jesus speaks of this kind of steward in Luke chapter 12, verses 41 through 48. Don't have time to really break this out because we've got to go, but let me just read the verses and just give you some key points. Beginning at verse 41, Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. 
But suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. And he then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and to get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour that he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten a few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Note some thoughts here, first of all, about some principles of stewardship that we find in these verses. Let me give them to you. I've given them to you on your sheet, I believe. Number one, a steward is someone, first of all, who is faithful and who is wise. You can study the text for yourself when you go home, but you'll find this in the text, that when God looks for his steward, he looks for his steward to be faithful to him. He looks for his steward to be wise. Look at the order of these two traits, because you must learn that a faithful manager is needed before you can become wise. God wants you faithful first, and then he wants you wise secondly. Are you with me? You say faithful to what? Well, to God's command, to God's will. See, we are to be faithful, watch this, to, to everything and with everything that God has given us. Secondly, the text tells us and teaches us to each steward, God gives much. Well, what is much? Well, much is everything that you possess, everything we possess, everything we control, everything God has given to us from the movement of our limbs to the various roles that we live out in our jobs and in our homes and, and we're in, in church ministry, our responsibilities that have been given to us. God is going to show us in this series that we are rich in every resource required to do good and to please the master with everything he has given us. Thirdly, the steward is responsible to others in the household. So he or she is to provide for the needs of the entire household. Can I get a witness in here? Uh, let, me, let me get two or three amens, if, if you would. You don't just provide for yourself. The Bible teaches us that the steward provides for others. And then fourthly, stewards know that they will be held accountable for their management, that there's a day coming when God will go before God and we'll have to give account of how we have managed the resources that God has given to each one of us. The master will return. You saw what happened when the dawn came back. And when he does, he will judge, the Bible says, and some will be rewarded, and the Bible says there are some who will not. And then fifthly, for the moment, understand that the master will not be present. That the steward in that time and in that in-between time between his coming and giving and now his returning, that it's very important that we make decisions, but our decisions have to be based on what we know the master wants and wills for our life. See, you've got some decisions to make. I've got some decisions to make. But we can't, do, we can't make those decisions based just on our own intellectual assent. Listen, we make those decisions based on what we know the master desires. And then six, because the master is gone, sometimes you won't know what to do. And you are in danger of doing the right, the wrong thing. And sometimes even the right thing the wrong way. So we must be totally dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead. Can I get a witness? And to show us the way. And if you don't get anything else out of the text, one of the things that you will know is always wrong is that the Bible says it's wrong that we mistreat others while we indulge ourselves in pleasure. 
See, everything we attach our name to, everything, every single thing you attach your name to belongs to God. There's going to come a day you're going to understand it doesn't belong to you. I know you think so right now. I know you're living life as though it is right now, that it does belong to you. But you're going to discover one day that nothing belongs to us. It all belongs to him. And the greater the gift that we receive from God, and God has blessed many of us in this house. How, can, can I get a witness? I, I know I got five or ten folk who can, who can get up and share testimony right now how God has blessed us. But understand this, the greater the blessing, the greater the responsibility. See, to be managers of those gifts that God has given to us. God's house is the world, and we are simply occupants. And God tells us to occupy until he comes, that we are all responsible for each other, but it all belongs to him. Come on. Come on, praise team. And so as we close out today, as we close out today, think of yourself. Think of yourself, first of all, of a, as a manager of God's trust. Think of yourself. As you leave here today, think of yourself. Think of yourself as a manager of God's trust. You know, to do, to do that, you do have to give yourself away. Yeah, you, you, you've got to give yourself away. And you've got to understand that it doesn't all belong to me. I'm simply a manager of God's trust. Secondly, we have to think of every single day as an opportunity for service. Every day that God's given us. Every day that, that we've been blessed to see a new one becomes an opportunity for service, for serving God, for serving others. And then thirdly, think of each of your gifts as a means to an end, not an end in itself. See, because God created us for his pleasure and gifted every one of us for his service. Stories told about the day when John Wesley's house burned down. John Wesley, you may or may not recognize that name in church history. He was theologian, the Wesleyan church, the Methodist church. Some people found him and said, John, we're, we're sorry to tell you this, but your house is burned down to the ground. John Wesley looked at him. He said, that's impossible. He said, no, John, for, for real, your house has burned down to the ground. He looked at them again and said, that's impossible. He said, we saw it with our own eyes, John. Your house is gone. He looked at him and again he said, that's impossible. It's impossible, you see, because I don't own a house. All right. God gave me a place to live in. I only manage that house for him. And if he didn't put the fire out, then he, that's his problem. He'll go, he's going to have to put me somewhere else. See, that man understood. He understood that he could have something and use something without possessing it. He didn't hold on so tightly that when it went down, he went down with it. All right. Some of us would lose our minds if we lost our house. We, we'd lose our minds if we lost our car. We, 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 we'd lose our minds if we lost our stuff. And God says that we are to possess nothing. Only manage that which he's given us to his glory and to his honor and to advance his kingdom. Over the next weeks, we're going to be studying how to become better stewards. See, good, good stewards, good stewards will seek the will of God to wisely manage all that God has given them, including their time, including their talent, including their treasure. We're going to look at the challenge of stewardship. We're going to look at the reward of stewardship. 
We're going to look at the practice of stewardship. Matthew 6, 33 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided for you.